I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Kendall Cronkite, the production designer for Trolls World Tour. Uh, you know, there's so many dazzling worlds in this film, and the and the first thing I wanted to ask was, which one did you get the most joy from design? Ooh, that's like picking a, ch a child, favorite child. Uh, um. <laughs> They were all super interesting and delved into, you know, all aspects of culture around music that it's just like a beautiful place to be for three years. Um, but I think ultimately I was happiest with country, with the town of Lonesome Flats. And it was actually one of the first locations we designed. But I feel like the the quilted, there's something about that quilted landscape and the simplicity of that and, and what it kind of represents that I just think worked really well. And with the four-legged centaur-like trolls, you know, that, I, I don't know, there's just like a combination of that with the color scheme and everything that we chose that just worked really well and honored the music and the culture around the music. Yeah. Now, on the flip side of that, was there one world that was more that you found more difficult to design than the other ones? Yeah, funk was one of the first we started with and one of the last we finished. Um, because of it for so many reasons, because it was Cooper who was a we discover as a funk troll and then we meet his family that are all Cooper versions of Cooper and how did we pull funk and funk culture and honor it into that world that was also inside a spaceship I mean so I guess what got us was that okay they travel in space we're going to be in a spaceship we based it on George Clinton's parliament his mothership famous, connection baby the mothership <laughs> connection baby and that he would have he he had a spaceship on stage and um we we're super inspired by that and about the concept around that and so that was our kind of kickoff point now on top of that is all the the trolls stuff which is the fiber inspiration the scale of these characters which are you know, like three inches high in our, if we were to look at it in our world. So, so it was fun because then we could go, it's shag, it's uh, metallics, it's um, their spaceship is covered in sequence. Uh, lava, lava lamp technology was really like, we brought that in like from that era and we just, we had a blast once we figured it out, but it took us a while to get there. Um, I, I know you had uh, uh, the uh, George Clinton uh, voicing uh, the King of Funk, which is just yeah. so such a perfect title because I believe that is his title. It uh, is. Yeah, uh, did you try to incorporate any of uh, Bootsy Collins in there? Yes. Oh yeah, you can see it in some of the instruments, like his double neck star guitar and his crazy costumes. But what was really funny was we actually. Uh, Tim Lamb, who was our character designer, he designed, we went through many iterations of designing um, uh, King Quincy's look and his costume and his hair. And of, of course, you know, George Clinton was definitely a, a real touchstone for us. But we had a chance to meet him. He came in to record and the directors wanted to show him his character. So we brought him in and he was literally dressed like King Quincy. He had a long gold sequenced raincoat that looked exactly like the cape. It was crazy. It was so much fun. And he loved the character, thank goodness, um, because he was definitely an inspiration for that. But yeah, Bootsy Collins for uh, Cooper's mom. We looked a lot at Betty Davis. Um, yeah, we dove deep into that genre it's really fun and we also love that genre so 
So you mentioned that uh, you were uh, talking that you were talking with the character designer, and something that I, and that that I was wondering was, do you ever find yourself consulting with the character designers for the film so that you could try and tailor what their what those characters' environments might look like? Totally. So Tim Lamb, who is our character designer on both movies, um, is also the art director of the film, which is really handy, and. Yeah, because our, you know, these are not human characters, they're trolls. And so um, as far as like figuring out now what is a funk troll. So when we did Trolls 1, we didn't originally know that our trolls were going to be, end up being pop trolls, which they are now in Trolls 2. And that we were going to have all these genres of music. So taking our trolls and blending them into that was kind of interesting because we didn't want to just dress them in a human costume that looked like a somebody you know in the seventies was would wear on the street if they were into funk music. So um, the idea was to kind of incorporate all these elements of the culture and the music into the design itself. So for instance, for uh, Trollex, who's the techno king, we, we looked at a lot of like raves and what people wore at raves and the lighting design, and then incorporated that into actually their texture, their body. So his, you know, his he's kind of a black light character and he has a digital readout kind of light scheme on his tail on his mermaid tail. And then he has a glowing internal heart that beats and that shows through his skin, but his features and everything are very digital-like and black light. And he's got beads, we have beads and a few things. Um, so it's like taking the costuming and, and everything about people that are that love that music or or performers that play the music or and incorporating that actually into the character design as opposed to just into costuming. Um, so yeah, and then how that plays with their world, it's all a balance. Yeah, and they have to be of their world. So very important. Were there any designs that you originally came up with where you later found yourself having to walk them back where because it just didn't work for one reason or another? Yeah. So for um, a lot of the hard rock trolls, again, going down that same path of they are hard rock they are not dressed as hard rockers we did a lot of them where their skin was like black leather like they were black leather characters or they were zebra characters or they were um like animal print or plaid skin and it just didn't work <laughs> it just looked silly and you couldn't quite tell they were kind of animalistic it just didn't quite work. So yeah, we had to backtrack on that for the characters. For the worlds, um, you know, these things, we, we designed them over three years. So a lot of things get tried that we pull back on. Um, but I think in general, most of what we kind of initially set out to do happened. Um, we had to pull a little back on just the complexity because it got complex really fast and it's already very complex visually. So sometimes it was a lighting thing or a, or a color palette choice or, yeah, but basically the ideas are still there. The concepts got onto the screen. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always interesting when, uh, I, I'm always fascinated by the differences between um, uh, 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 jobs on films uh, as opposed uh, and contrasting how they're done in live action versus how they're done in animation. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of the differences that you encounter in doing production design for an animated project as opposed to a live action one. Well, there's a couple of things. One is just that we we literally design the characters. So that's that's a big part. We don't hire actors. The others are we can't shoot on location. <laughs> I mean, that's a big one. So everything we create is created from scratch. Um, you know, from pebbles on the ground to the building over there. But you know, it's all comes from 
zero. We start at zero. And then another big thing for production designers is that I do the lighting on the film. I oversee the lighting. I work really closely with head of camera. We have a really strong partnership, but I do the lighting part of that partnership and uh, it's called head of layout. They do the camera and all the blocking and the scouting and, um, and that kind of thing. Um, I would say those are the major differences. So uh, I was, uh, before we did this interview, uh, I actually looked up uh, your filmography and uh, I saw that I think the first major feature that you worked on, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, yeah. it, it says you were an assistant uh, art director on that film. I was. Uh, and that is such a uh, cult classic and uh, just, uh, and not even cult, but just a classic for especially, you know, uh, people my uh, uh, people my age. I want to say kids my age because I was a kid when they came yeah, out. Yeah, I uh, bet it was a long time ago. <laughs> what was the experience like of working on that movie? You know, talk about luck, man. That that was my first animated feature. So before that, I I did not work in animation. I was a um, editorial illustrator. I just moved to San Francisco from New York. And um, I had a friend who was doing work on it, who called me and said, I have a project for you that you're absolutely right for. And you should really, I want to give your name to the director. And I had never intended to get into animation. It just was not something I ever thought about. And um, I met with them. And the thing was, is that my personal work was very suitable for Nightmare. It kind of was in that vein. I was a punk rocker. Everything was black and white. I loved Tim Burton. He, I was like obsessed with Tim Burton at that time. And it was like perfect for me and a perfect starting place in this industry. Um, it, I mean, working in stop motion is, it's like magic come to life. So we were in a, warehouse in down in the southern south warehouse district part of san francisco um it was city toe after that <laughs> like it was literally a warehouse that had no insulation it was freezing in the winter and so hot in the summer that they would bring popsicles in for us every other day um <clears throat> and up above was where story and um uh, production and art were and then you'd go down into these huge sound stages down in the basement that were all divided by velveted curtains that went on forever with all these little nightmare sets that were built by what was beyond that a big you know construction hub and then beyond that the puppet area um and i was super lucky because it was a super small crew that I just got thrown into the deep end. So I was designing upstairs and I was also down on those sets, prepping them for shoots. So I was painting on sets. I was helping set up lighting. I was gluing, hot gluing everything down before the animator got on there because, you know, these shoots take sometimes days if they're really complicated. And if a prop, <laughs> you know, like, the glue gets a little melty and you'll just see over the course of the shot, this thing go in the background. Boop. And I'd be like, ah, oh, they have to reshoot it. It would be awful. So we would do whatever we could to like basically nail all that stuff down. It was, it was a, um, on the job education. It also taught me to push boundaries stylistically that that can be incredibly engaging and charming. Um, um, and I feel like I've carried that idea throughout my career and tried to push not just the technology that we make these things in, but just the visual approach to these films. Um, yeah, it was great. 
Well, Kendall, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best uh, over this upcoming season. And to all of our viewers, please uh, like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks again, Kendall. Thank you. Rock on, Charlie.